All right, how y'all feeling? Great. Are you feeling straight? Great. Are you black. feeling black? black? Are you feeling proud? Right. I'm gonna say it again. Are you feeling straight? Straight. You feeling black? Black. black. You feeling proud? Black. All right. Look, look, look. Straight black pride is so good. This is the first time conservative white folks beeping their horn. <laughs> Finally seeing some straight black folks. <laughs> and all the black folks been pulling over, coming through, shaking hands. I didn't even know we had black folk out here. Where we at? Where we at? Uh, Annapolis? Annapolis. Annapolis, Maryland. We got black folks pulling their cars over saying, thank God you finally got here. So tell me when we ready, brother. Ready. All right. So I want to first thank everybody to this rally. We went around and asked people why they came out. This is so important. I want to tell people where this started with me and how I got here. And I think to some degree, on some level, everybody can understand this because we've seen it and heard it in our lives. I was 15 years old, and the best friend I had at the time at the school I was at, I was far away from home, definitely wasn't home, was a sister. And the sister was from Jamaica, and we were just best of friends. I was 15 years old. And I still remember the steps that we were sitting on. Because of course, I was at a boarding school and when the bell went off, you had to run to get back in on time. And I'm sitting next to her on the steps, waiting till that time. I'm hoping the time just goes a little slower because we always talk. And she said, I want to tell you something that I've never told anyone. And I'm like, well, if you want to tell and you never told anyone, you can tell me. I want to listen. And she told me, I don't remember the age, but I know she was very young. She was in Jamaica. I believe it was a family member, older, raped her. And I'll never forget how I felt. I felt as a man, I was 15, but still on my way to manhood, I felt like a failure. Now, I wasn't in Jamaica, but the fact that somebody would harm a black child, and this was my friend now, I felt like I had failed. And without any way to do it, just my spirit, when she told me what happened, I said, I gotta kill this person. Anybody that would do that to a child would have to be someone who should die. Now they call it capital punishment and it's legal, but it's all the same thing. No one should be targeting children for harm, particularly sexual harm. It's abhorrent. It doesn't belong anywhere on this planet, anywhere on the earth, nowhere, no time, never. It's wrong, always and forever. And so she told me she never told anybody and her father was a Jamaican guy. I had seen him or heard stories about him. I'm like, why you didn't tell your father? Because I know what he'd have done. She said, that's why I didn't tell him. Because he would have gone to prison. Because there's nothing you could have said to my father to stop him from doing what he would have done to someone that harmed me. And I say this story because the road to where we are today has been a long one for me. This was in 1988. I'm 15, I'm almost 50 years old now. And at 15 years old, I said, whoever rapes and harms children should be eliminated from this planet. And I thought there's four or five guys, we gotta go and find out where they are on this planet and give them a, a message from God. And if it ain't from God, a message from us. You can't harm children. Little did I know that I was headed for a journey in my life to find out that rapist and monster in Jamaica has a huge team of people and friends all around the world that believe in harming children. But the difference between that day and today is that when it happened back then, they had to hide because there were men on the scene 
who if they found out what happened, would deal with the monsters the way you deal with a monster. Today, something has happened to us as men where the monsters now come into the schools and bring books to our children to tell them what they want to do to our sons and daughters. The monsters are not hiding anymore. The black men are in the closet and the monsters that want to harm children Came are out in the open. After that time at 15 years old, between 15 and 18, I thought I was living in like some kind of horror story. Because when the sister told me her story, it opened something up in my spirit. And between 15 and 18, every young lady I would talk to, maybe not 100%, but probably 90%. And believe me, I was talking to a lot of young black girls back then because I was trying to talk to as many as I could. But every time we would have a conversation, they said, I want to tell you something. So much so that it got to a point, I almost started finishing the story. And it was always the same story. Somebody in the family, or close to the family, took advantage of me, raped me, harmed me. And I didn't tell my father because I knew what he would do and I didn't want him to go to jail. And I heard that story over and over and over again until I realized this is not a one-off. This is not one monster. There's a secret in our community that can't be that secret because everybody's going through it, all of the women, but nobody wants to talk about it. And whenever I would go talk to brothers about it, there would be two responses. Either they didn't want to talk about it at all, or they would say, man, I'm getting angry. This makes me mad. I can't listen to too much more of this because if I feel like I know who's doing it, we got to do something about it. As time went on, I joined an organization that was about empowering black people. And I met some strong warrior brothers from Washington, D.C. And the reason I got a brotherhood with them is because the one thing that they would talk about and weren't afraid to talk about and cared about that nobody else I knew wanted to talk about, no other group that I wanted to go and listen to lectures or nobody really wanted to talk about this. But these men all said the same thing. Sexual abuse is going on in our community. And since it's going on in our community, we have to organize, figure out what's causing it, and make it stop. I fell in love right then. I said, that sounds like what manhood is supposed to be to me. That sounds like manhood. Not shooting each other over colors, not selling dope. I want to be part of this manhood, stopping people from harming black children. I thought it was young girls. As I got older and began to lecture, it hurts me to say it, but I started studying because we saw a lot of effeminization of our men getting like this. Y'all remember? Some of y'all remember. How many saw Three's Company? Who watched Three's Company? Y'all remember? Remember Jack, uh, Mr. Roper said like this? <laughs> yeah, some, some guys like this, you know, they wasn't straight. And we start noticing there's a lot of this stuff. So we start doing lectures to talk about it being a problem. So I did the research. It horrified me. I had no idea that they had a NAMBLA, North American Man Boy Love Association. This 1995, I'm in the federal government working, doing my little job, GS7, and I'm sneaking off to this new thing called the internet, and I'm finding out about a NAMBLA, North American Man Boy Love Association. I'm like, this can't be real. They would have to be locked up and charged and found guilty, and all of them would get the death penalty because it's not possible for a man to think that he's supposed to be looking for sex from a little boy. 
I did not even know the concept existed. I didn't know there was a history of it. I didn't know there was a culture of it. I definitely didn't know that's what I was fighting. I was trying to fight some black monsters in the black community, raping my black women. I wanted to stop. That's where I thought it was gonna end. But as I began to do the research and study slavery, I said, whoa, sex farms, breeding farms, what? This is a culture that comes from somewhere else and they kidnapped us and forced introduced us into this new culture, L-G-B-T-Q. Force culture, force imposition that we learned through something called slavery. I began to do lectures and share that information with people. Did you know this came from slavery? And our people were horrified because they were like, no, we didn't understand. And I'll never forget, it took me off guard because I was doing it because of what was happening to our women. And I knew that during slavery, black men were being raped. And I knew that I saw homosexuality, that must have came from slavery, of the black men being raped and the uncles molesting in the families. But I didn't know it was happening because I never experienced it myself. And that's not something that men like to go out and talk about. So, I was lecturing about it and an elder, he had to be in his 70s, maybe 80s. He came up after the lecture and said, young man, thank you so much. You helped put a lot of things in perspective. And he was an elder, so I didn't understand what he was saying. And I was just like, thank you, thank you, and turned my head and he held my hand, he wouldn't let it go. He said, son, are you listening? He said, you helped put a lot of things in perspective for me to understand in my life. He was standing there with his wife. So I thought it was so beautiful because the message he gave me was that I've been through stuff. I didn't understand it, but I made it. But you helped me know it wasn't my fault and understand how it happened. That's some healing. And so when that happened, I realized this is a lot deeper than I thought. I picked a heck of a fight to want to get in. I just want to stop people from messing with our little sisters. Now, I got to worry about brothers. And then, over the years, what started happening, and I thank every brother that did this. I've never told your story. I promise you that, on my word, on honor. These black men came to me and said, brothers, strong brothers, hey, almost like the elder. Man, don't ever stop doing what you're doing. I'm like, you know I'm not, brother. Now they're like, nah, bruh. Don't ever stop what you're doing. Especially that part where you say there's nobody's fault if that happens to them. It's not their fault. They're not the wrong one. I said, no, no question, brother. He said, no, you're not listening to me. I said, ah. He said, yeah, bruh. Don't say nothing. I said, bruh, I'll never say nothing. He said, yeah, I'm not like that. I know you're not. He said, but bruh, it happened to me when I was younger, you know, and I never understood it. I never got into it, but it messed me up. I've been out here wilding out, getting crimes and stuff, because I've been trying to deal with this pain. But you help me understand, it's not me. I said, it's not you at all. And I've had so many men that have come and told me that. I've never told their personal stories, but I'm speaking for all the black men in this country and around the world that are going through this. Because so many black men in America, when they meet me, they tell me, and it, it, it makes me stronger because I know that there are men that want to fight this and they got more investment in it than me and that what I'm doing helps them. But little did I know that I would walk into a time where the people with the most power on the planet all the guns and the weapons and the school system and the politicians and the money, everything. Little did I know that they would come forward and say, we're going to make everybody, everybody's going to have to bend over and let us have your children. I did not expect that.
I thought they were coming for just us as black people. And that's all I've ever cared about. I never could have imagined that you were going to have pedophiles running countries, bending over, sniffing children like Jeepers Creepers. If you'd have told me that there was going to be a commander in chief somewhere in the world that can't stop sniffing children, I would have never believed it's possible, not in a major country. I would have never thought anywhere where there were still men living that you could show me someone multiple occasions molesting children live in front of a studio audience with the mothers and fathers standing right there watching and people would go out, watch that, and then vote for somebody like that. You would have never told me that. Jeepers Creepers not a movie, it's real life. I'd have never believed it. This is where we are. I'm gonna go across seas. I want people to see here the straight black pride banner. And I want you to see that African continent because we were kidnapped and enslaved and we were taken from Africa. But for those of us who know who we are, Africa was never taken from us. Why am I saying that? I say this on behalf of all my brothers and sisters on the African continent who don't know that their brothers and sisters here in America are still fighting. We have not bent over to the LGBTQ imposition. You just can't hear our voices because our voices are banned just like everybody else that has something worthwhile being said is being banned. We love the fact that you're saying no to this imposition in Africa. And I'm going to go across seas for a moment to let you know something nobody wants to say. I was in Uganda talking about this in 2014. You have to watch out for this LGBTQ imposition. The war is coming. And I was lecturing and lecturing and finally one of the people there said, brother, it's not coming. And I turned my head and said, y'all don't get it. She said, you don't get it. It's here. And I said, what? In the Congo. I want y'all to hear something about these French and what the French do. Babo Baruti in his book, Homosexuality and the Feminization of African Males, he told us, uh, Baba Africa, Leila Africa said, the French prefer to rape the men first. I'm going to say it again. When the French armies come in, they rape the men first. I was in Uganda. They told me in the Congo, they're trying to get their gold and their wealth. There were these boys that I was supposed to do interviews with. <sighs> these armies that would come in, funded by the West, would take these boys and the men in the villages there were civilians. And I, I went and got an actual article of the brother that told the story. He said, every morning they would wake us up, every morning, and have 11 boys stand in a row and rape us one after the other. Every single morning. I'm gonna say it again. The French brutality and homosexual rape of African people is something you cannot imagine the magnitude. And so for every African over these hundreds of years of what the French have done, it's time to put them out, all of them. There's no uh, apology for such savage behavior. That's why our brothers and sisters in Haiti won that war because they say this type of savagery is uncivilized. We will not succumb to it. Get out. And that's what Africa needs to say today. Get out. France, out. This is sick and it's perverted. I'm going to come back on this side. That's on behalf of all my brothers and sisters on the African continent. Hold strong. Don't bend over. Stand your ground. Black man. Black woman, black child, there is no other alternative. 
That's what it means to be an African. That's how every African gets here. Look at this one more time. In case you get it confused, a black man, he stands upright. He's not a coward, he's a man. He defends his family and his people. A black woman, she doesn't fight with him except to make him fight harder. And she's there with him the whole way. And then the black children are the ones that come behind and say, mom and daddy did it good, but wait till I get my shot at it. I'm really gonna show them how we build civilization. That's how we build a race of people with family. We're here today, not as the end or the middle. Where's this flag? I want somebody, I want, I want, I want to come over. Come on, walk with me to the flag. I want everybody to come over here and see what a real flag looks like. Let's stand it up straight and, and hold it up, hold it at the bottom there so we can see it good. This is a real flag. See, they have a flag that they're taking in, putting on our children with all kind of sick books, all kind of filth and degeneracy that they're teaching our people. It's not our culture. The 13th Amendment said that slavery was over. So maybe they're trying to uh, 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 totally destroy the Constitution. I don't care Constitution or not. They're not going to do this to our children. We're going to fight. So we're saying, look, the American flag, we saw what happened recently. First, under Obama, an Obama nation. Get it? It's an Obama nation. Obama. Anyway, y'all get that. I'll let you catch up with that one. You got that one? It's an Obama nation. In this Obama nation, they took the White House and put it in the gay colors, telling you that the, the, the house that rules the land is the land of gay, whatever gay means. Used to mean happy when I was little. It don't mean happy no more. That don't look happy to me. If we thought that wasn't bad enough, they came and told all the white folks, you said it's America, that's your White House, that flag, red, white, and blue. They, I don't know if y'all saw this. I'm not making this up. They actually took the American flag, moved it to the side, put the LGBTQ plus AI something or nothing, and wrote it right up the middle and said, we have conquered America, LGBTQI. Well, we tried a little bit sometime to take our American citizenship and stand on the Constitution, but it doesn't appear to be working that well right now. So what I'll say to the LGBTQI and all of that stuff, you may have conquered white America, but we have not complied. This is black America's flag. Right, right. You ain't gonna wave your flag next to this uh -huh. one. This is our flag, because it's who we are. Yes, the black man will always be with the black woman and always produce black children and black families. It was that way yesterday, I saw on the set, they had Haru. It's that way today, that's how all of us got here. And I don't care how many letters you put on it, we will always be a people that believe that a man's supposed to love a woman. Love her like nobody can love her. Donnie Hathaway said, I love you in a place where there's no space or time. That's a whole lot of, only a black man can love like that, man. That's right, that's right. That's all scaring you. I swear, where is that place? He said, ain't no space or time. That means a long time, but ain't no time. He, he done beat, Donnie Hathaway beat out Thanos. That's the real reality stone. The real reality is that it takes a man and a woman to bruise children and family. And we ain't going nowhere. This will never change. We'll never be another people. No matter how much fighting we got to do, we'll just fight until we fight until we fight. Now, I want to just go ahead and do this on behalf of black people. Can I brag a little bit? Can I brag a little bit? Can I brag for black people? Yes, sir. And I want y'all to look down there. We got a flag down there. Just, I just want everybody to see the flag is everywhere. Before we are finished, this flag is going to be so many places in America. You're going to say, is that America now? No, that ain't an American flag. That's a all African people anywhere on the planet flag. That's our culture flag. I'm going to tell you. Y'all feeling good? Yes, sir. Is it worth being out here? Yes, sir. Do you feel strong? Yes, sir. Let, let, me, let, me, let me deviate for a moment. I'm going to go to something that I think is so beautiful. The day that we're doing this on is a very special day. August 21st, 
See, something about days and times, people talk about numbers and all. I'm not good with that stuff. But it's one date and time that I do know and I love. You know, when you were little, they would say, who's your favorite black American? Who remember that? And we all pretty much said Frederick Douglass because we found out he took the whip. Somebody's whipping and whip, whipped the guy. We said, we like Frederick Douglass. Some of us said Martin Luther King. Some of us said Harriet Tubman. You know, the sisters, you know, they love that Harriet Tubman. She said, she said, Harriet Tubman said, look, you got to keep running because you're not going to snitch on us. So you're going to run or you're going to take that long walk. <laughs> you ain't coming back from. So he kept running. But my favorite black emerge for me has been, is, will always be. The reason for the season, the reason I get up in the morning is Prophet Nathaniel Turner. Right. And I'm going to tell you why. The most profitable business in the history of the world was the trading of black bodies. Us as African people. No one has ever made more wealth than all the people who made themselves rich at our expense. And that includes not only the white enslavers and the Jewish ones that financed it and controlled it from the top, but the black race traders that rounded us up and sold them to them. And the Arabs that participated too. Everybody involved, black, white, Arab, anybody who participated, particularly the white Americans here, the most profitable business in the world. Why would you stop doing it? I'll tell you why. Tomorrow would be the day that really got it going, the Haitian Revolution. And I'm not going to stay in Haiti, but just give a shout out to my Haitian brothers and sisters. Y'all better be celebrating tomorrow the birth of the Haitian Revolution. But after you sprung that victory in Haiti, See, they love this straight. They love to see men and women standing strong. Everybody loves to see it. Because everybody's suffering because they're coming out to the children and don't know how to do it. We'll show them how to do it. I tell you what's so beautiful. We saw what the Haitians did and the brothers and sisters in America said, nah, we can do it too. Would you believe one man named Nathaniel Turner called four men to the woods and said, we're going to end the most profitable business in the history of the world. How? We gonna pray to God? He said, we done done that part. How are we gonna do it, Nat? We gonna go negotiate? Nope, we not negotiating. How are you gonna do it? We're going to go and stop the people who are enslaving us from enslaving anybody ever again. They can't be here no more. Slavery must end. And 30 something years after that, we saw the Civil War and it ended. But Nat Turner's rebellion was the spark that let everybody know America can become Haiti. We are not going to comply. Yes, we've had a lot of hard times. We're still going through difficult times, but guess what? You start talking about men got to be women and women got to be men and telling men they can't have women no more, black men, you're starting to fight. That's and right. we don't fight for nothing. You ain't going to tell no black man he can't have a black, black That's one. a fight right there. That's a fight. So you're starting to fight. So. Four men started the process for ending slavery, August 21st, 1831. What is so beautiful, they had to do that hiding in the woods because you can imagine what would have happened if they had gotten found out. We well over 100, almost 200 years down the line. And guess what? We're not fighting to get out of slavery. They trying to take our children into slavery. And now we're not in the woods nowhere. We right out here in the front row on the pavement telling the world we will not comply. We started here, this is the ceremony of it. The Haitians did the ceremony in the woods but nobody can hear and see. They did it the right way at the right time. That's not the time we in. If you got trannies running around here in front of little children waving eight things in front of children out in the open, where the men at in the open? Where the real men at in the open to say, nah, we don't do it like that. This is how we do it. We got to show people how it's done so we're not hiding. We right out in the front and we telling everybody we're coming. We're coming to the school boards. We're coming to the political places. 
We coming to the prisons. We come everywhere that this is being pushed on our people. We coming and we asking the real black men to step up and say no. Step up and say we're not going to tolerate you pushing this filth and junk down our throats. And we going to ask our women and actually tell our women, if you are our women, which you are, then being our women mean when we start fighting for what's right, you got to support us. We can't have you going out here supporting every filthy bird in the community, every pedophile and R. Kelly in the community. We trying to clean it up and get it out. We made a lot of errors and a lot of bad decisions. Now we trying to clean it up and you want to defend it. You can't do that. We need you on our side to protect children from this filth. It's the only right side. You have no alternative. Clean yourself up, clean your mind up. Come be with your black man that wants to stand up and do the right thing. We need you. We've never done anything without you. The Haitian Revolution, y'all were the ones that started poisoning the slave owners so that we could get some freedom. Now turn to talk to Cherry Turner. And they had the plan, if it didn't work out, how the family would still live. The family is still here today. I know I got married on the property. They're still here because the women supported the black men. Without your support, we do nothing. We need your support. And we need you to start telling your sister standing next to you, hey, wait a minute. That's a good man doing the right thing. You shut your mouth right now. Let him finish speaking. We need good, strong men. I heard some sisters screaming down there saying, that's right, I like that. I like to hear that. Any sisters out here that like strong men? I couldn't hear, they can't hear. Any sisters out here that like strong men? All right. Any strong black men out here? Tell me if you're out here, black man. Yeah. We're, we're here. here. We're here. That's what I want to hear. So I really want to tell people how important what we're doing is. The brother said before, and I think it was so profound. Children cannot defend themselves. This is how we know how bad this thing is. It's not just the children. We as black men have not defended ourselves. We try to go to work. They want to force us to take gay classes right. and gay understanding courses right. and let gays come in and do whatever they want to do. But then when you want to come in and do something positive as a masculine man, particularly if there are children around, that becomes criminalized. Black men got to organize, come together and say, no, it doesn't work that way. In the prison systems where they got so many of our young men that need guidance, we got to change the way that thing works. I need the brothers to step it up. We got to say our men, our boys are being destroyed because they don't have strong manhood. And we know what it takes to get them right. And you can't be teaching them to be effeminate and then want them to come out and be better men. It doesn't work that way. We got to remove these obstacles to prevent us from raising strong men. And so we're out here with our flag, the Straight Black Pride Movement, to say we are here, we're not going anywhere, and you're going to see this around the country. Everywhere that you are, where you see this is a problem, we're going to begin to talk to brothers and sisters around the country at Straight Black Pride. And we're going to say, how do we, on a practical level, make this the culture that has always been, that it is today, and it always will be. And we're going to tell them point blank, we don't want to see nobody else put no other flags or ideas on our sons and daughters. Our sons will become strong men. Our daughters will become beautiful, strong, intelligent women to be partners so that we can continue to have families. That is our responsibility to take the first step as black men, black men and women that you see here. We've taken the first step today ceremoniously and now the hard work begins. So with that, I want to wrap it up. But I want to do three straight black prides, loud, strong, and proud. Can y'all do that with me? Yes, sir. I'm going to say it, then you say it after me. Straight black pride. 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 Thank you, brothers and sisters. All right. Let's, anybody else want to come say anything? Brother Shaka wants to close it out? Yeah, peace and blessings. Uh, Y'all already heard the, the, the first.
strength for the mighty I.O. from out the irritated gene in Southeast, uh, leader of the Straight Black Pride movement um, that is headed by some pure, strong black men as well as uh, beautiful, strong, uh, committed goddesses that are relentless. Uh, and some of these brothers and sisters, wherever he goes, they, it, it doesn't matter where he's at, they follow him and they're willing to put their lives on the line, whether it's being arrested uh, uh, or even, even fighting great soldiers to the core, to the death. Because our sisters have to see us engaging in these enemies for them to regain confidence in the black man and in the black community. Right. And so we have to remain strong. This is why I'm telling you, parents, get up off of your asses and stop allowing these colonizers to infect the minds, hearts, and the bodies of our babies because our selfishness, well, a lot of you all that are selfish and just self-centered and thinking that the future is yours, you, you can forget it. There will be no future right. if we don't fight and be willing That's right. to That's right. and die for these babies. Right. So I'm going to let the brothers speak. As y'all know, I'm General of the Street Law Soldier, Shaka Sankofa, and this has been fire. My spirit is on fire, and I'm quite sure I can speak for the straight black pride movement in terms of their energy at this point from the uh, master teacher, Irritated Jim. I agree this fam. Uh, just first and foremost, I'd like to thank my brother Ayo, my brother Shaka, and the rest of the brothers and his sisters because as brother Ayo put it, we're nothing without you. We need the mitochondria and the feminine energy along with our masculine energy to balance this thing out because the foundation is all about family. And I just want to throw a corner note in there to, the, to those who, because another part of slavery induction is the mentality of giving your time to somebody who don't appreciate you, what you stand for and your values and your integrity. I walked away from corporate America and started my own business and it has been successful thanks to my community. And I just want to throw this in about this That's Fed right. Now. We will not support Fed Now and the digital dollar. We're going to go back to what we used to be in terms of bothering and taking care of one another as families did. That's right. We're going to protect our children and our women if it costs us our life or anybody's life because that's what we represent as men in this country and around the world. So we need everybody's participate. Don't You can't live in fear because we're in the spiritual warfare and the biochemical warfare and it's coming at your door so you can choose your poison. You can choose your poison, but we're gonna fight this thing out. We're gonna protect our children. Nobody else gonna do this for us. Nobody's gonna do it with us, but us. So as though the important numbers, and we want quality, not quantity, because we want those coming from the spirit and the heart. Thank you. I'd like to thank Brother Ayo again. I'm going to do this. I was done, but I'm going to do something from the heart. And I don't know where it's coming from yet. Somebody told me you got to come from the heart. <clears throat> come on, buddy. Since I was 15 years old, I've really been waiting for the opportunity to really do something totally meaningful for my race. And I've done a lot in my life. But nothing means more to me than protecting black children from what I see is coming at them. I hate this stuff. And with every fiber in my body, I want to organize African people everywhere we are on this planet. Not only to protect our children, but for our survival as a race of people. That's the only reason I get up in the morning is for this fight. So I, I thank everybody out there that's tuned in. Share this message, feel this message, become this message. This is not allegory. You can't turn on the television now without things like Sound of Freedom saying that they're coming after children all over the planet. The determination as to whether or not it will be our children more than other people is made in the next five years 
with the fight that black men make in fighting to protect the children. If we say it's not our children, they're going to go looking somewhere else. Shouldn't be nobody's children. But like the brother said, ain't nobody coming to fight for our children but us. That's right. That's so we got to come together. Make that your fight is our fight. We'll see you on the battlefield. Thank you, Straight Black Pride. Straight Black Pride. Thank you for watching this video. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Also, follow us on our other social media platforms. On Instagram, we're at dc.radical, the numeral one. On Twitter, we're at dc underscore radical underscore one. And the cash app is dollar sign dc radical one. Again, thank you for subscribing. A BB for ODA and Straight Black Pride.